right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to all of our first time guests and everybody watching online. Let's give it up for everyone visiting NCC. Welcome today. We're glad to have you here. God is a good God, and we are going to study His Word. I'm so excited about today's session. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you for your Word. Your Word is a lamp for our feet, a light to our pathway. I pray, God, that our hearts could be receptive and that we could truly dive into Scripture and swim in the ocean of your grace and just see how you have great things in store for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. So good to see you all today. You look good in church clothes. Turn to somebody and say, looks like you've been losing a little weight. And I'm just trying to help you, right, with the people around you. <clears throat> well, we're, we're, uh, we're talking today about exponentiality. That's the one word that I feel is for us today. I'm going to look at the multiplying power of God's grace. We serve an awesome God. We serve a miracle-working God. How many could use a miracle? How many believe in miracles? You, you believe that God's a miracle-working God? Yeah, He saves us. He delivers us. There are things that He does for us and around us that we have no clue. There are times that we're rescued and we don't even know it. But the beauty of, of the gospel is that it's the power of God unto salvation. That, you know, Paul said in, in Romans, he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of of God unto salvation. And so I've got good news for you. Y'all ready for some good news? The good news is, is all tied to Jesus. I'm going to talk about uh, how Jesus changes everything. But I've got a few questions and things I want you to consider, questions to ask, things for you to consider. Number one is that are, are you living by the power of, of more or are you living by the power of less? Now before you answer that question in your mind, just consider what it's like to be subtracted from. When the enemy comes in to diminish you or make you feel small or to steal from you, there, there is the power of less at work. The power of more is so dynamic. And when you consider your life and you match it up with what's presented in the Bible, maybe you would feel a little less than. Maybe you feel like you're frustrated. Maybe there's someone living with anxiety or depression and Maybe you're living with fear, uncertainty, and so when you compare your life with what the Scripture says, you, you may feel like that you're living by the power of less, and that could, be, that could be true, because there's more to grace than just being saved. There's more to God's grace than just escaping hell. The power of the gospel is so efficacious, it works within us and around us and through us, in Mark's gospel, right after Jesus rose from the dead, in Mark chapter 16, you read the whole chapter, but I just want to get a few snippets out of this chapter. He, he appeared to many of his disciples, and some of the other disciples didn't believe it. They didn't believe a word that, that was told to them. They didn't believe he had risen from the dead. And so when he appeared to those that didn't believe, he, he challenged them. He admonished them. He in the King James, it says he upbraided them. In other words, he, he confronted them. Their unbelief was so strong. And then he, he goes into this last <clears throat> statement right before he ascends to the Father. He's talking about famous last words. Well, these were his famous last words. Words that we need to pay attention to, specifically because they were chosen to be spoken by him at that time, for that moment, and for our admonition even now, in 2022, he, he tells them to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them, and whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. But then he, he goes on to say, and these signs, check it out, and these signs in verse 17, Mark 16, 17, these signs will accompany those who believe. And here they are. In my name, and that's key, everything we do, we do in the name of Jesus. In my name... They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink it deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. What a strong word to those early believers. What, what hope it brought them to know that 
He ascends to the Father, but yet He's equipping them. He told them in another place, greater works than, than these shall you do. I'm going to my Father, but you're going you're to be equipped to do a work for me. It's kingdom work. Anytime Jesus would perform a miracle, it was an illustration to His sermon about the coming kingdom. And the same was true with the early church. Whenever God would show up and there would be miracles, it was just to be an illustration. Not to just be a one-off miracle, but it served a purpose. And so there is an authority, an uncommon authority that we can have as believers. We live this exponential life. We, we live the life where the, the, the power of God's grace is multiplying. It doesn't just sit dormant in our lives like a can of green beans on the shelf. No, God's grace is cumulative. It's ever-growing. It's powerful. And so they march right away from that moment with Jesus when he ascends. And he gave them this last word, this last admonition. And after they're endued with power and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. In Acts chapter 3, and you can read this at home. In Acts chapter 3, there was a man that was brought to the temple gate, the gate called Beautiful. He had been brought to this, this gate for many years. He was 40 years old, we see in this story. He had been lame from his mother's womb. And when Peter and John are walking up to the temple, he looks at them, they look at him, and he gave heed unto them, the Bible says, expecting to receive something from them. He wanted the handout. But I like what Peter said. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible says immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength, and he stood up. And he ran and jumped and would leap and run through the temple. People were amazed. They knew this guy. 40 years of being lame, and now he's healed. It was a miracle. Well, the authorities hear about it, and they're deeply troubled. They don't want to have anything like this going on. Wondering how this happened, and it was the message of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus that was being preached. And so they put him in jail, locked him up overnight, and told him, and here, this, is the, this is the takeaway from Acts 4. It says you can't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Because the, they knew that the power of preaching in the name of Jesus was so efficacious, it produced a healing in this man's life, a miracle. I think there are many people today in the Christian church living by the power of less because not, of not believing or not taking God at His Word. Now, last, uh, a, a couple Sundays ago, uh, we tore out pages of the Bible just trying to illustrate the fact that, that some people are actually doing that metaphorically. They just say, well, that Scripture's not for me, that Scripture's not for me. And so what happens, it renders the, 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 this last-day church incompetent or, you know, at the very least, uh, not having ability to... To, to walk in the Spirit and to be led by God. And so what we have here is people living by the power of less by just not taking God at His word. Weak in faith, low in power. There may be someone here today and you say, yes, that's me. I'm struggling in all of my relationships. My job is so dehumanizing. Children at home are messed you know, The house is messed up. There's rebellion. There's anarchy at home. My, the, 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 my marriage is, is, is off to the wrong, wrong start. Life is monotonous, uneventful. Things are just going wrong, one thing after another. And, and, and if you analyze the people that lead unhappy lives, you look at the conversation that they're having. Look at what their focus is on. They, they don't have an active, growing faith in Christ. They're living by the wrong power. We, we, we're starting up our... Our connect groups and two of our groups, Freedom in Christ and Free to Lead, are groups that are led here at the church, one on Wednesday night and one on Sunday night. I would encourage you, if you're not already in a group, to sign up for Freedom in Christ, or maybe that group is maxed out, sign up for Free to Lead. And you're going to see in these sessions the, the explicit gospel. You're going to hear it on Sundays. We're, we're going to preach the gospel every Sunday, preach Jesus every Sunday. But, but these classes are so explicit. I had one uh, person here at the church, a guy who's been pastor, pastored for 40 years, said uh, to me, he said, I went through freedom in Christ, and even as a pastor, as a leader, all those years I, I discovered things that I, I didn't know I needed to know. And this is true for all of us because we all need to take a deep dive into Scripture and to, and, to, and to focus on Jesus more. There are little nuggets of truth in the Bible. You may have been reading the Bible for years, but you'll stumble on something that's like, wow, that, 
that's what I needed to read or see or hear today. When you focus on Jesus, you'll see that he's not just a justifier. He doesn't just forgive your sins. He doesn't just take away your sins. He adds to your life, but more than that, he multiplies. So he's not just a justifier, he's a multiplier. When we talk about the power of more or the the ever-growing cumulative effect of God's grace, this exponentiality, this multiplication of God's grace, it opens for us a world that maybe we didn't know existed. I think many Christians instinctively know they should be living by the Bible, but they're kind of like in a, in a quandary of like, okay, well, I, I look in the Old Testament, all right, I see, I see the people of God, and I see how God is providing for them, and there's miracles, and the children of Israel were led across the Red Sea. Through the Red Sea, the waters parted, and there was manna that came out of the sky to feed them, and he gave them shoes that didn't wear out and clothing that didn't wear out. There was water that came out of the rock. There was a pillar of fire that guided them at night and a pillar of cloud that guided them by day. And they conquered the promised land and giants were slain and God was in charge. And I see the Old Testament, I think, I'm kind of jealous of that. Well, well, let's go to the New Testament. So we go into the New Covenant, we see the early church in the book of Acts and we see God's power to do great work through his church. We say, well, that's all you need. We'll just read the history of this, and hopefully we can be inspired. And then all the while the devil is beating people up, and people are under his thumb and feeling like the enemy's taking over their lives. And we we wonder, like, where where is the power? Where is God? See, Christ does more than just justify us and and forgive us. We're not just, you know, hoping to make it to heaven. That's where a lot of people are. There's no joy. There's no enthusiasm for life. There's no power. Low in faith. Low expectations. It's kind of like the little boy at, at, at Disney. His parents took him to Disney. Of course, it costs a lot of money to go to Disney. He wasn't having much fun that day. There was a pastor that, that saw this happen. The fam- little family is over there, and the little boy's crying and trying to get on rides. He was just crying. And, you know, you have to take out a small loan if you're going to take your family to Disney. And, matter of fact, those of you know, so many of you are nodding your heads. I have some pastor friends down in Florida, and they have a saying that you know, when their church members miss church to go to Disney, they call it paying tithe to the rat. Some of you are already offended. Don't say that about Mickey Mouse. Okay, that's a side note. Anyway, this family had paid a lot of money, and their kid wasn't enjoying it. And the, the, pa- the pastor that saw this, he's, the, the mom was frustrated. They were hollering at the little boy, and he was crying, and he and, and she said, you're going to have fun whether you like it or not. See, that's the way it is with many Christians. You read the Bible, you hear sermons, you need to have the joy of the Lord. You need to be full of the promises of God. And it just, like, you're not there. You, you don't get it. It, it. It's a struggle. See, look what it says in John 10, 10. This is, this is this short verse that we all know. It says that the thief, this is Satan, right, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and to have it more abundantly. Y'all, this is a huge promise. This is a huge promise. What's so cool about this is that, you know, the word abundant seems to be enough. Oh, we're going to have an abundant life. Abundant is that ever-growing, cumulative, you know, multiplication of of God in our lives. Uh, uh, you know, I'm living the abundant life, but he added the word more to it to emphasize it. It's a more abundant life. So the Christian life is, is, is not just about having more, and this is where we can, we can get messed up. It's not just about having more. It's, it's about being more. The Christian message changes us. It's efficacious. The message of Jesus, the gospel makes us more like Jesus. It transforms us. There's transforming power. There's, there's equipping power. And then not only being more, but it's knowing more about God. Yeah, we, we'd love to see miracles, and I believe that God wants to do miracles among us. I really feel like that was God's word to me. It has been God's word to me in the last few weeks. But yeah, and that's great, but it all starts with knowing God. To know God When we know God, there's going to be more things that flow from our knowledge of God. Look what it says in in 2 Peter 1, 2. And we've got to read this slow because if we skim through this, we're going to miss some wonderful truths. Look at this. 
man, I'm going to holler a little bit today, y'all. I'm excited about this. Look at 2 Peter 1, 2. It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let that sink in just for a moment. According as his divine power has given unto us all things. I circle that, all things that pertain to life. I underscored in my Bible, I underscored life and godliness. Through the knowledge, you see, it's about knowing God, right? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us, man, this is, see the cumulative wording here, exceeding great and precious promises. Come on, we can hold on to the promises of God, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So, yeah, as a believer, there are times that God will do things for us, but he's really doing his work in us as much as anything. And that's the, that's the huge takeaway. We're partakers of his divine nature. Someone might say, well, how can I know God as my father? Well, it's through Jesus. Through our faith in Jesus, we become children of God, and we now can cry, Abba, Father. And it's through Jesus that the Holy Spirit is now uh, deposited into our lives. The Bible says that he'll send the Holy Spirit in his name. And so through Jesus and through the preaching of the gospel and hearing the gospel, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall he preach except he be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of Christ. Hearing the gospel, obeying the gospel, knowing it makes us more acquainted with Jesus. It affects us at a very deep level. So when you, when you break it down, you see that the, the more abundant life or more abundant living is the multiplied blessing of living at a higher level of knowing and experiencing God's grace. More abundant living is the multiplied blessing of living at a higher level of knowing and experiencing God's grace. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. I've got some scriptures for you today. Y'all, these are great verses. Look at this. For all things are for your sakes. 2 Corinthians 4.15. Look how this reads, that the abundant grace, grace is abundant, it's, it's, it's progressive, right? It's a, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many, look how this reads, that through the thanksgiving of many, redound, and you read it right with a D, redound to the glory of God. That's the Christian life. That we're living in such a way that his abundant grace is affecting people around us and it's just it's ever growing. How can we tap into this? You, yeah, you got saved by grace through faith, but that's where a lot of people stop. They've got the can of beans on the shelf, and they got grace, but grace grows. God wants to grace you in a greater way so that it, you're not just rebounding. A lot of people are rebounding from problems in life. You know, they have a bad breakup. You know, a guy's dating a girl at school. She breaks up with him, and so he rebounds and dates his best friend's girlfriend. See, that's not good. Don't try this at home, y'all. You know, our best efforts of trying to get back what we've lost are always going to fall short. It's rebounding. A lot of people, you know, I could give you a good speech on how to rebound from a, a, a struggle in life or how to bounce back, but that's not what we're talking about. Here. To rebound to the glory of God is to overflow exponentially to bring glory to God, for, for your life to bring glory to him, not for you to bounce back. It's the abundant life for the glory of God, and it affects so many people around you. So let's get in on this progressive, ever-growing grace of God. How is this possible? Well, let me, I'm going to break it down in four simple points, and we'll wrap up. Number one, and that is humility. More humility means more grace. More humility well, okay, I know I need to be humble. We can read books on how to not be prideful, but that's self-help. There's no way in the world that we can conjure up on our own humility. Oh, I want to be so humble. You know, I used to pride myself that I was humble. See, that's not humility. It just doesn't work. So, so you're hearing this, yeah, I want to be humble. If more humility means more grace, well, look what it says. Let's just read it, and then we'll unpack this real quick. In James 4, 6, it says, God gives us even more grace. We're talking about living by the power of more. More grace, as the Scripture says, God is against the proud, 
but he gives grace to the humble. So, here's how you humble yourself. You give yourself completely to God. And then look what happens. Stand against the devil, and the devil will run from you. You know, when, you, when you're surrendered, when you're in a posture of humility, yeah, you will have authority over demons. Demons will run from you. If you're prideful, you can't come against Satan. But you, if you're just like Satan, you have no power over Satan. Well, let's talk about Satan. He was once the anointed, according to Ezekiel 28, you see this, this, uh, this uh, snapshot behind the scenes. He was the anointed cherub that covered, was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was his covering till iniquity was found in him. That word iniquity jumped out to me when I read that this week. Iniquity. What is iniquity? Well, there's two kinds of sin. There's transgression and iniquity. Iniquity is, is overconfidence, self-confidence. It's pride. It's hubris. Satan had so much pride. He wanted to ascend and be higher than God. He was kicked out of heaven. So he tempts Adam and Eve with the fruit. Hey, you can be like your own gods. You can be, own, you, you can be God. And so, they, so that seed was planted in them, that, that lie. And, and so human nature, we have this, the pride of life. It's, it's iniquity. Iniquity is deep-seated pride. When you think about it. Uh, transgression is you cross a line. You break a law. You break a rule. And that's sin. But iniquity is deeper than that. It, it, it goes to the core of who we are. And so how can I not be prideful? How can I not have... Like, I do not want to displease God because God resists the proud. There are many people that feel the resistance from God in their lives is because they're pride, prideful. So much pride. So how, it's not just talking about it. We have to focus on Jesus. The more you, if you fixate on why Jesus was broken for you, he will fix what is broken in you. When you look to Jesus, we survey the wondrous cross. Paul said, I determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. God forbid that there would ever be Sermons preached in Christian churches that do not involve Jesus. We have to preach about Jesus. Yeah, well, I've already heard that. No, we keep coming back to the cross because coming back to the cross affects us. It's efficacious. It works. It's the power of God into salvation. It changes us on the inside. So we look to Jesus. In, in Philippians, you won't see this on the screen, but it says that he took upon himself, Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And it says that he humbled himself. And it says, we're to have the same mind as Christ Jesus. How can we have humility if we're not focused on... So the more we focus on Jesus, we see him and his humility, and it affects us and gives us humility. It, 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 it takes away our iniquity. Isaiah 53 shows this. The Bible says that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Wow, what a heavy load he had to carry. It also says that he was, he was wounded. How can I say? I almost feel like tearing up when I quote this. He was wounded for our transgressions, but he was bruised for our iniquities. I'm taking a little more time on this first point. We're talking about humility, mean, more humility more, means more grace. Well, when I look to Jesus and I see how he was, he was wounded for my transgressions, for the laws that I break, but also he was bruised, the deep brute force trauma that was leveled against his body produced a bruising, a deep bruising. He didn't just bleed out, he bled inward. He didn't just bleed out to remove our transgressions and the little laws that we break, but he, he was bruised for our iniquities, for the deep-seated pride that we all wrestle with so that we can, we can experience a life and be graced with the ability to be humble. Lord, give me that type of humility because more humility means more grace. Check this out. And it's progressive because it's more grace means more thanksgiving. That's my second point. More, more grace. So as, as humility is entering into your life through Christ and your study of Christ, then it produces this, this, this grace that's unprecedented, then, then it's, an, it's coming out in the form of words. The Bible says in Colossians, check this out, it says in 4.6, let your conversation always be full of grace. See, what grace does, grace edifies and grace multiplies. Grace, are you speaking words of grace? Are, are your words 
You know, are you using your mouth as a means of grace? You're not using foul language. You're not cursing. You're not, you're not uh, gossiping. You're not bringing people down with your words. Are your words kind or are your words cutting? Are your words wholesome or are they vile? Are they grateful or complaining? See, because thanks is really the echo of grace. Grace and thanks are the same word in most languages. So when, when, when you're saying thanks, it's an echo. Matter of fact, as you live your gracious life through humility, people will begin to say thank you to God for you. Wouldn't that be great, Wayne, if someone is talking behind your back and they're not talking against you? They're, God, I thank you for Wayne. What a great man. You know, thank you for sending him into my life. That's the redound to the glory of God. Because the graceful life you're living produces the thanksgiving of many. But, but not only in them, but also in your own heart. You're living a life that's... Because that, that echo of God's grace, thank you, thank you, thank you, it multiplies. Remember when Jesus fed the thousands, a little boy's lunch was brought to him. And the scripture says that it was five loaves, a few small fish. He took that meal, and the Bible says that he gave thanks. Think about that just for a moment. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, giving thanks for a meager meal. You say, well, you know, I don't have much to be thankful for. I, I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a nice house. My car is run down. You, well, if you can be thankful for the little that you have, look what happened when Jesus gave thanks for that little meal, it multiplied. Talk about the multiplying power of, of a thank you. The Bible says there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children, which means there was probably about 10,000 people. 10,000 people were fed with that meager meal. Jesus multiplied it. Of course, that's Jesus, the Son of God. But I do believe that when we are living thankful lives, it's echoing God's grace. We're living lives of humility, and it, it reverberates in the spirit world. And I believe that God gets glory from that, because that's the next point, is the more thanks you have, the more glory God's going to get. So if more humility means more grace, and more grace means more thanks, then certainly more thanks means more glory. The Bible says in the end time, the last day, that people will be, they will, even though they know God, they will not be thankful or glorify Him as God. You'll see in Scripture how thanks and glory always go together. Thanks and glory. Because the more thanks there is, the more God gets glory. There, I'll give you a story there was uh, 10 lepers, and leprosy was a dreaded disease, and it still is. There's certain parts of the world where they have leper colonies, and it's, the nerve endings of the body are destroyed, and the, the person can wound themselves, and they never know it. And their sores will fester and become infected, and, and, and they, their, their lives are contagious. And back in Bible, day, Bible days, lepers would have to uh, sequester themselves away from the population away from their families, and they had to shout out, unclean, unclean, and, and everyone knew they were coming. They made a noise, and they, they would walk in, in herds. It was an awful sight. The story is amazing. In Luke's gospel, it tells us the story. You, when you get home, read it, that these ten lepers were cleansed by Jesus, and he sent them to the priest to go show themselves, to make sure they were clean so they can get back into the population. But there was one guy, and, and Luke says that it was a Samaritan. And by the way, Samaritans were considered dogs. It's interesting that Luke points out that he was not one of the other guys. He was a Samaritan. He came back. And the Bible says that he gave thanks with a loud voice. And Jesus marveled, and he said, how come he's the only guy that's come back to give thanks? To actually, he said, to give God glory. So you notice that in this context, the man gives thanks, but Jesus sees it as giving God glory. And he says, sir, your faith has now made you whole. Some commentaries talk about that this man received a second dimension of supernatural deliverance. And could it be that the other guys were cleansed and still had the scars and missing fingers, but this man was made whole? This is what I believe giving God glory can look like spiritually. When we live a thankful kind of life to give God glory, there's a healing, there's a wholeness that comes to us as Christians. But here's the next thing, is that more, more, more glory, this is my fourth point, I'm closing with this, more glory means more strength and power. I want to live a life of strength and power. I don't want to be a weak Christian. I don't want to be a Christian that just is barely making it. See, that's where a lot of people are. They, you know, I hope I can get to church on Sunday, and that's the extent of some people's Christianity. The Christian life is so 
big. It's so amazing. God has so much in store for so many of us. I believe the Lord. I, I know I didn't eat a, a taco that made me wake up at night, but I feel like God has, I've, I heard his voice that he wants to give. I told first service that he wants to give a miracle. He wants to perform a miracle here at NCC. I don't know who it is. I don't know who's, who, wh- what your needs are. There, there, there may be some pretty heavy-duty needs. And if I were to ask you to raise your hand, do you need a miracle in your life? I, I think we would be shocked to see how many people are waiting on God, waiting for God to show up beyond the pages of a, of a history book, beyond the pages of, beyond the words of a sermon, but the, the, the reality of God to just be present. Look what it says in Ephesians 3.16. It says this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, look at this, riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Isn't that interesting how that's worded? And to know, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. In other words, wow, there's so much more than what I can fathom. That you might be, they might be filled with all the fullness of God. Look how it reads. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages glory in the church he starts off with strength and power and the love of Christ and it passes knowledge and then he he gets in this part now unto him who is able y'all to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. And then he speaks of glory in the church throughout all ages. We're in the church age, and I think sometimes as believers we see this in the Bible, but we don't apply it to our lives. We are tearing pages out of the scriptures. But what are you, what are you praying for? What, what have you been asking God for? You know, he's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. You say, wait a minute, that just, is that really true? It's in the Bible. Oh, well, that's just, just for the church in Ephesus, right? Don't make me start tearing pages out of the Bible again. Y'all, this is God's word. What would happen if we took God at his word? If we begin to ask him and seek him, believe for it. There's a story in the Bible of a widow woman and her husband was a friend of Elisha. It's in 2 Kings 4. It's an amazing story. Her husband dies. She's down to her last dime. Doesn't have anything hardly. And so she calls for Elisha. He says, ma'am, what do you have? She said, I've just got this little jar of oil. That's all she had. She said, the creditors are coming. and going to put me and my, my sons in jail. And he says, you know, um, what do you have? She says, I've just got this, this jar of oil. He says, go to your neighbors and get as many buckets and containers as you can imagine. Just get, a, get as many as you can. So they go get them and bring them into the house. You read it. And so they start putting these containers. And she doesn't know what's getting ready to happen. They just gathered as many as they could. I want you to imagine with me what... God wants to do in your life and the containers he wants you to have in order to receive you know maybe it's faith you know so your level of faith according to your faith be it unto you so it's a silly illustration that I have her on but this really happened and so they set these containers out and she began to pour the oil from this one container into this container and then this container she went around and filled all of them and he says do you have any more containers she said no I've filled them all the Bible says the oil stopped. Indulge me just for a second. What if she would only got like three containers? Well, the, there would have been the oil for those three containers and it would have stopped. 
God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all than what we can ask or think. And yet our faith is so small and so little. God wants, you say, I just don't believe. You know what? I'm not going to be able to convince you today. You know, I, I tried first service and so I feel sometimes when I preach, I'm, I'm trying to convince people to, that God loves them. I can't, only the Holy Spirit can come to you right now. And yet, you know what? It bears witness with your spirit that God is speaking to you and he's wanting to do amazing things in your life. And I don't know what that may look like. It may be a son or a daughter that's gone far from God and it would be a miracle for them to be saved. You know what? God, we pray that God would save them. It, it may be a physical situation, a health situation or financial situation. I'm not one of those name it, claim it, blab it and grab it kind of preachers, but I believe that I'm standing on God's word today and, and God wants to do some amazing things here at NCC in Muskogee. I believe there's a revival that we're right on the threshold of a revival in Muskogee. I'm not talking just about our church now. God's doing a work in Muskogee. Let's believe for that. How many lives can be touched? How many miracles can we see happen? And you know what? For, for those who believe, you know, for those who have faith to ask, you know, could it be? Could it be that God is just waiting for us to, you know, draw nigh unto God? He draw, draws nigh unto you. I want you to stand with me today. I preach way too long, but I want you to feel the liberty to respond. In first service, we did this, and we've been doing this for several weeks. Uh, prayer team is going to come and stand at the front, and our elders and elders' wives, uh, our staff, all of our staff. We have a good prayer team, and these others that are, we're going to just spread out across the front, and uh, the worship team is going to lead us in a final song. And here's the, here's the catch. Right now, it's, it's easy. We, we, we can just dip and head to the restaurant. But let, let's, let's hang in just for a moment. Hang, hang on just for a moment. Let, let's, let's make room for God to initiate and start a work. Last Sunday, a gentleman came forward and, and he said, man, I almost didn't come up. Because, you know, he, I didn't know. He said, he said, I talked to my wife. Should I go up? You know, like, I've been in church a long time. Or people going to think I'm a dirty rank sinner if I go up and get prayed for. Y'all, we're, we all need God's. We, we, we need God, right? Scott, we all need God. We're here. We, we all need God. And we all need God to show up on our behalf. And it builds our faith. And it's kingdom work that he's called us to do. So as they lead us in this final song of talking about our awesome God, I want you to feel safe. And these people are going to spread out so you don't have to form a queue. They're just spread out. And we're going to be here to pray with you and to agree with you that God can do a mighty work on your behalf. Come on. Come on, y'all. God loves you. You just need to to own up to it. God loves you. he, He wants to do a work in your life. Just respond. If you need salvation, just respond today. Today's, this sermon is for some, I've preached this sermon as if it's the last chance I get to preach. I'm just pouring my heart out today. God's waiting on you. God's ready to do something in your life. You just need to respond. Just act in faith right now. Just say, you know what? I'm going to respond. It may seem silly, but I'm going to go up and have prayer, right? I need someone to agree with me in prayer, no matter what it is. He's able, come on, he's able to do exceedingly, let's take the lid off of it, abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Come on, let's worship.